Oh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Software Architecture panel. I'm Austin Shu. I'm a lead software mentor on DevRC Team 971. I'm Wes Hardiker. I'm a software mentor for 1678. And I'm Marshall Massingill, a mentor for Team 900, the Zebra Corns. Uh, I'm Alex Yuan. I'm a software director for Team 254. Hi, I'm Ludi Wong. I'm a student on 1678, and I'll be moderating this panel. Awesome. Let's uh, move on to the next slide. So uh, we're talking about software architecture today. I'll start off, what is software architecture? Uh, it's really something that's a bit nebulous uh, to define. However, uh, key components, uh, by and large, the, the first one is outcomes and stakeholders and identifying who those people are and kind of what your outcomes are going to be. So what your su success criteria is going to be, how, how to define a successful project. Uh, it's not just limited to software people. So your project needs to be, uh, you know, your software architecture can be well-defined beyond the scope of just the, the software folks. So in the instance of a robot, let's say, uh, you're also going to involve your mechanical design uh, groups so that they have some say in ultimately how things are going to function and that groups are communicating together. So uh, software architecture helps define kind of a high-level structure for a project. So again, not just robot projects, perhaps you've got fantastic scouting software and uh, you're going to need a well-defined architecture for that. So it, it involves people, process, and technology. Uh, not just any one of those, but all three in some combination help define what software architecture is going to look like. So next slide, please. So uh, one of the big hallmarks for some of us on the panel and the way we deal with our software architecture, particularly for the robot side, but not just the robot, uh, it's about defining interfaces. So handoff uh, intersections between groups uh, as well as between uh, kind of components of a robot. So what that ends up looking like, uh, which can also help define choke points and define what your data looks like. So what it's not, uh, software architectures, not overkill. Uh, it's not plumbing, if done correctly, and it's definitely not a military industrial grade solution in search of an FRC size problem. Uh, Well-defined architecture for a robot can actually help uh, a, a team to be more successful. So with that, uh, I don't know if we want to go to the next slide or we want to uh, kind of have the discussion here with the panel. Austin? I think the next slide, so we were going to do that in 15 minutes. Uh, so. Yeah, so let's start discussion among the panel, and I guess we want to throw the first poll now too. So there's a poll for uh, people yeah. to click on. Keep and so that is uh, that is the poll. The mute. <laughs> so uh, take a look at the poll. I, I forget what uh, Woody. Can you go over what the the poll question is real quick? Yes. Um, our first poll question is: Do you have a predefined software architecture you work under? And so while we're doing that, yeah, go ahead, Wes. One of, one of the things I think that we'll we'll discuss a lot today is is do you carry architectures from year to year, and how much you know reusability can you get? And I, I'd certainly like to hear from you guys while we're waiting for questions to come in too. Of you know, have you gone through major rearchitectures at any point, or you know, how do you handle that? I know um, in 1678 we switched recently from C plus plus to Java, which meant you know we start all over again. Um, and so that was an adventure. Um, so, uh, Austin, you want to? I, I feel like you guys have probably one of the longest running architectures. That's it, it is constantly shifting, but I do feel like it's something that has been around for a while now. Yeah. So we, I think we're on Rev two of our architecture. The Rev two versus Rev one isn't huge. Well, it's big, but it isn't big. So we've mm -hmm. been using kind of a publisher subscriber model. So you know, things publish messages, and then things subscribe. So kind of an example here is um, when you read your drivetrain encoders, for example, we have an application that reads those, publishes them out, and then we have another application that picks those up, um, tries to figure out you know, what power to apply, runs all our control loops, publishes the results as an output message, and then that gets picked up back up by the drivetrain. So that's kind of our high level. And then if you look at how that's evolved over the years, um, the first couple of years we were doing this, it was a lot more like slap things together, see what works. 
so the messages were less defined and um, kind of what lived in what place was less defined. And over time, that's kind of stabilized. We've kind of converged on a drivetrain process that tends to be almost the same application year to year because we have the same similar numbers of wheels and motors and you can kind of configure it to meet our needs. Joysticks haven't changed in a decade, so we've kind of just been rerunning the same code there. Um, and then the superstructure gets rewritten every year just because yeah. it's a whole different robot. Um, but if you look at over time, we kind of started with more of a multi-threaded model and we've drifted more towards an event, event loop-based model. And that was actually a full rewrite we did uh, end of 2019 and ported That's all of our old robot code over. Do you wow. still make use of multiple threads or no? Uh, we do multiple processes now. OK. So it, it, they're threads, but they're much more isolated. So that gives us a um, couple powerful things. One is like if there's a bug in the superstructure, we can keep driving, which is powerful for us. And then also, um, you can actually swap modules out live. So you're practicing and you want to update the superstructure. Well, you know, redeploy just the superstructure and you're off. Yeah, I'd say that's one of the big things that's kind of, it's continuing. We're, we're seeing dividends now from the investment we made early on with the way we've gone. Uh, it took us the better part of two seasons to effectively use ROS the way we wanted to on the robot and create the the kind of long-lived code that we were aiming to create to start with. Um, and it for us, it's the same pub-sub model. The only difference, uh, well, I won't say the only difference, but one of the big differences is that it's not something we wrote from scratch, um, which there's nothing wrong with that. You know, our, our, our solution is definitely heavy handed. Uh, it, it takes a lot of processing power. Uh, barely ran on the Robo Rio for a while. Um, we actually had some code commits that we went to submit it back upstream to the project uh, to fix some issues that were specific to the 32 bit ARM architecture, which resolved issues for us. Um, and those got accepted. Uh, the other thing that came about is other people found other problems that we didn't know existed. So between all that, we've actually seen performance upgrades uh, because we've kind of kept up with what the latest is. Um, we don't get a new architecture, but we do get a new like software release about once every two seasons right now. So our big upgrade this past year was to move from ROS Kinetic to ROS Melodic, which actually solved a bunch of our problems and brought all new ones. Um, the next big upgrade for us will be Noetic, which is still ROS 1. Um, but we're heading in that direction. And it's definitely a multi-year project. Um, what's really cool for us, uh, most of our team is juniors and seniors. Uh, in fact, it's the primary like students on the team. So for us, we're starting to see students now who are working with code that they had absolutely nothing to do with writing two years ago, three years ago. And that's truly impressive. Um, the fact that it's been something that's been handed down from one generation of students to the next. So, and Alex, I, I don't know much about the 254 architecture, um, but maybe you can talk about how you guys have developed it. Is it something that's lasted for multiple years? Yeah, so um, throughout the last couple of years, uh, at least, uh, the architecture like for our robot code has been uh, basically like pretty, pretty much the same. Um, that's pretty helpful because a lot of stuff like um, a lot of the handoff points are the same, right? So uh, if we use different uh, like autonomous controllers, um, we can kind of just uh, plug them in, right? So um, in 2019, I guess, uh, we were pretty short on time with uh, like we were, we didn't quite have an autonomous uh, stack like kind of set up. Um, like we were working on that maybe like a week before competition our first competition. So um, it was really nice because we were able to just kind of plug in our um, adaptive peer pursuit controller stuff from uh, 2017. Uh, so that was really, really nice. It saved a lot of time. Um, that's, I guess, one of the benefits of having like a, a reusable software architecture. Well, you know, there, there's always a point where you have to re-architect something. And, and uh, please, to the audience members, do ask us questions if you, uh, if you have specific comments about architecture in general. But um, you know, one quick point about about re-architecting is you, you'll always end up redoing some piece. And so I think when Marshall was introducing this, he talked about having an API or some sort of, you know, what are your handoff intersections and things like that. If that is really well documented, really well, you know, in place, then in theory, you can rewrite this this one component 
And as long as you don't need to change API significantly, and this is true for like any coding project, right? If, if I, if all of my math is handled in one place and I'm interacting with a database or, you know, I'm interacting with something, if I have that API and I'm going to switch from a database to, you know, a network based, uh, you know, server or, you know, to a completely different database, I want to minimize the impact that, that my different components will have across my entire architecture. And that's, Easier said than done, and actually re-architecting it a couple times helps you find those interfaces where they weren't well done the first time. Yeah, it actually, I'll, I'll add on to that. It's not just um, in terms of defining the the kind of heart, the, the, the handoff points between things, but a solid architecture can help when you're, say, upgrading uh, hardware platforms, which is not something most teams are doing regularly when it comes to the robot side, but they are probably doing when it comes to scouting. New tablets become available, um, new laptops, new versions of the tablet OS that you're running. I know for us, at least from the robot side of things, we're upgrading our processor basically every season at this point, um, thanks to the folks at NVIDIA. So they drop a new thing, and we're off to the races with trying to figure out how to integrate with it, um, which is fantastic. And the fact that our software, like it's portable enough to go from one platform to another, it speaks volumes to the amount of work that open source community has done to help bring things over and the way we've like added on to that to take advantage of it. So. Another fun one along those lines. So we were able to upgrade from uh, BeagleBone and C-Rio to the RoboRio with only changing the part of our software that's responsible for interacting with the hardware. And the entire rest of the software just ran first try on the RoboRio when it came out. So that was really yeah. cool. Like we had to find the interfaces correct that we could completely swap the robot controller out and just have working code almost immediately. So. I have a question along those lines. How easy is it for you to swap to doing simulation? Um, we It's actually trivial. So we have an interface. We do it all the time. Actually, we develop all of our robots in simulation. So we have this event loop abstraction layer that gives you callbacks for when messages show up, and then an object that lets you publish. And we're able to use that, and we have a, both a simulated implementation of that and a real one. So we build up a little simulated robot model, hook it up to our our, our process and then just let it rip and see what happens. And um, that lets us do some pretty cool testing so that when we switched out the entire bottom layer of our stack about a year ago, we just reran all the tests and when they all passed, it just worked on a robot. That's awesome. So the tests are pretty key here for trying to make sure that you can preserve behavior across the evolution of your software. All right, it's probably about time to switch into the next section if we could get the slides back up. Um, so Austin was going to switch into talking about over-architecting, right? Oh, yeah, and there's the yep. results of, uh, so it looks like most people do have predefined you know, software architecture to work under, six to four. Um, and that, yeah, that's a good thing, so, so I aim for that. So. Other direction. <laughs> right, there yeah, we go. That was, that was a, the poll was independent. <laughs> ah. So um, talked about kind of laying out what architecture is, but I think it's worth talking about kind of what architecture isn't and how to not let it become too big. So this is kind of one of my favorite quotes. quotes. Um, I don't care for simplicity on this side of the com complexity, but I, would, you know, I really do like simplicity on the other side of complexity. Um, so uh, what is good archi oh, well, over architecture? Um, good architecture should get out of the way. Um, it shouldn't be, oh yeah, I got to type in 50 call sites in order to make this what button go move something. It should be easy and natural. Um, in robotic, or well, in products in general, you get to pick between scope, time, and cost. Um, these, these get a little different with robots with volunteers, but um, with FRC, you really have a time deadline. So you really get to go negotiate between scope and cost or resources. And so you really do have to compromise there and make sure that you pick the right size solution. Um, people are bad at time estimation. So my favorite rule here is um, if you think it's going to take a week, it'll probably take about pi weeks to get it done. And then um, really, uh, it's worth talking about in architecture, not just for problems you're solving, but also what are you not going to solve? You know, maybe you say this year, we don't have enough resources to make sure we log things, or our diagnostics aren't going to be as good, or we're going to have a simpler autonomous mode so we make sure that our vision tracking works, or you, know, you really want to lay out those compromises so that um, you make sure you focus on the right things and deliver. Um, so I. On, on the planning side, I like to kind of adhere to the 80-20 rule. So I like to be about 80% planned and about 20% chaos. Um, and this doesn't mean like the project should fall apart or anything, but um, 
if you make everything perfectly planned out at the beginning, then you're probably not taking enough risk. And we really try and try, strive for, um, Marshall mentioned processes are important to architecture. We try and make sure that our processes are simple too. We don't need industrial sized solutions for um, simple projects. And then uh, another one of my favorite ones is the Yagni principle. You ain't gonna need it. So um, I know our robots change over the year and I'm sure your guys' all change as well through the season. Um, so if, if you don't know what things are gonna look like, you have to be ready for change. So make, make sure that you only build what you need and you're not really trying to box yourself too much into a solution, but you don't overinvest if you don't, if you're not ready. And then my last bullet point here is kind of about empowerment. If you really make your architecture so specific and locked down and everything, that um, you'll take some of the fun out of it. So with that, I will open it up to other thoughts. Yeah, and please audience. Yeah, and um, we, we do have another, sorry. Uh, we Go have ahead, another poll. poll. Oh, let's yeah. do the poll. Um, our poll question here is, does your team document your architecture? And it should be on the same link. That gets you know into I think what Marshall was talking about last time of of how do you know how do you train for t multiple years of of students and I, I would think Alex you must have you know a lot of experience if you have a long running architecture you know how do you how do you keep training from year to year where people are coming in and having to look at code they've never seen before I know the first time I'm actually a fairly new mentor when it comes to robotics I haven't been doing this that long I've been writing code for years but. It was like, where do I start? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you start at Maine, and then you know you figure it out from there. But there's a lot to read for a brand new student, right? How do you guys deal with that? Yeah, so um, we have some documentation in some of our libraries. Um, it's not super extensive for like everything. So um, what we'll often do is, uh, in the last couple of years especially, we've had uh, workshops which um, kind of go over like some specific part of uh, our code, like. Um, I think one workshop we had was uh, like working with stuff like state machines, uh, singletons, stuff that uh, at kind of kind of low level, but stuff that students like don't necessarily have um, they they haven't necessarily worked with before uh, like before FRC. So um, those workshops are pretty helpful. Uh, it's good to have like some kind of project or something that the students can work on as well, so they kind of can get more familiar with um, what exactly like the code they write or adapt should be doing. Uh, relative to like other parts that take input or output to that uh, whatever their whatever their code is doing. So it looks like we have a question from the chat. Um, do your teams use a specific approach to software development such as agile? So I can uh, so uh, our, go, yeah, go oh, good. No, well, no, I, I was going to say, the, I, I do, uh, I guess my official title is DevOps and Cloud Native Architecture something something. Anyway, uh, every shop is different. Every business, every, uh, they're all different. Um, so one, one person's Agile is not necessarily another's. Uh, to answer your question, though, uh, do we use Agile? Uh, we try and use portions of an Agile mentality. Uh, things are never done. There's constantly a rolling uh, set of tasks that need to get done and uh, try and get them into a state where we can pass them off to where we can do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So it's really adopting the iterative approach that Agile has. And I think the best teams don't just do this with software. They do it with hardware too. In fact, 1678, so Wes, you, you've you probably seen this and I suspect all three of you folks, I, I'm floored that I'm on this panel with you. Um, but I suspect all of you have the same kind of mentality when it comes to the rest of the stuff you're doing. It's not just the software architecture, it's all of it. So you iterate and iterate and iterate, and then every time you encounter a failure, every time you have an issue, you open up a bug report or you, you make note of it somehow, track it in some capacity, and then resolve it and move on to the next one. So. Yeah, our, our uh, I mean, we have you know multiple software teams, and you're right. You know, I think every team, even within our with our, our larger team, does a different way of handling things. And yeah, we have, you know, almost all of them have some sort of backlog of here's the things they have to do. And the important part of that is prioritization, right? I think you know, in the over architecting line of things, it's like you've got to learn to throw some things out. If we don't get to this, we can still play the game. Right. Well, how do you how do you define that success matrix on the on our scouting system? You know, it's actually it's very well divided into two week code sprints and you know the backlog of stuff that's reviewed and you know stuff that's assigned. People work in teams, 
but I agree that, that assigning a label to something means that you constrict yourself to just that. Instead, take you know bits and pieces of a, of a management methodology that work for you, because I can guarantee things like Agile and all the rest of them, you know, there's, there's been a, a number of, what was the one with uh, two people always working together? Um, uh, that was huge for a good number of years too. Like program take, yeah. yeah, there we go. Extreme programming was one of them, Extreme yeah. programming, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's these trends, right? I can guarantee that none of them were designed to six to eight week projects, right? Which is, you know, robot, FRC is like, you have such a short time frame that, that these, these other things are really designing for, you know, quarter long projects, you know, in the business world. So take the pieces that work for you and, and be willing to throw them out, you know, year to year and, and re refigure out what's best for your model. I really like your point about prioritization, Wes. I think that's yeah. the key here. Um, the, yeah. the parts of Agile that we use is essentially trying to make sure that we're very, we're quick to change. Um, we're trying to figure out what's the most important thing to get the robot up and running and move the project forwards and kind of keeping track of those kind of blocks of work, not in huge level of detail. Most of this ends up in people's heads or in a spreadsheet when we start to get worried enough that we have to write it down. But kind of keeping track of the priorities of work, making sure that the most important things are done being done first and our best resources are on the most risky things and then just continuing to check in and make sure that we keep that holding. Also, if I can poke you about one of your bullets on your slide, can you talk more about the 80-20 rule and how, how does that play out over, you know, uh, say the six to eight weeks? Is it 80-20 from the beginning to the end? You know, for me, there's always a whole lot more chaos in the beginning. It's like 80% chaos, you know, in the first week and then it, you know, you get, you sort of swing the other way. How do you handle the the twenty percent chaos toward the end of the program you know, as, the, as you're getting close to the competitions? Yeah, um, well, that's where people kind of they'll start to rally together when they see that things like, oh shoot, we're super close, let's get this over the line. That kind of creates a little bit of excitement sometimes um, with some students. Some students don't get it at home, but the ones who really get excited, that little bit of that excitement helps make it kind of fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. I think the thing I always worry about is um, if you spend too much time planning, that's almost a waste because you could have invested that in making your project go faster. Um, and then also uh, too much planning can make things a little sterile. So it's never fun to plan and it takes a lot of time. And then when you execute it, it's just kind of turning a big crank for a long time. So that's kind of where we focus there. And then when your architecture starts to converge over time where it's a very similar pattern, so that takes some of the risk out so we're not going to have as many of the big level, the high level discussions for how to structure all of our code, because we have we've kind of worked that out in the off season and previous seasons. I don't know if I yeah. fully answered your thought there. So I know I know for us like that eighty twenty rule comes into play. Like I I wouldn't say that we intentionally plan for chaos. It's just chaos is part of the nature of what we're doing. Um, there's always something like you can't get a part delivered in time. Uh, the, the you know for us it's dependencies, right? We're dependent on other bits of software, and we don't write it. Like we're dependent on the open source world to maintain that and write it, which has been interesting. Uh, right now we have a this cascading level of dependencies, which is preventing us from upgrading to the latest version of ROS, um, and it's it is what it is. Like we'll, we'll get there eventually um, once all the pieces fall in line. Uh, but that chaos comes into play throughout the season as well um, when things don't, like, we pull down an update that broke something that suddenly we've got to go figure it out. Um, I wouldn't say we plan for it, though. That's That, to me, is interesting. And I'm, so the question I have, based on your comments, Austin, and it's not just for you, but for everybody on the panel, how big is your software team when it comes to the robot side of things or to any given project, for that matter? I guess I can start. Um, we seem to have about three to four students who seem to be recently engaged. There's always the long tail. We'll have like five to 10 students involved, some of them at different levels, and then two to three or to four uh, really engaged throughout the year. And then we're really lucky to have a lot of mentors. So that lets us really spread that burden around and make sure that there's a lot of resources for those students. And if things are getting critical, um, We've essentially practiced extreme programming up at the deadline. Like, hey, kid, mentor, go. Let's get this done. You know, we need awesome. to put our best brains on this. And so that's been, we've seen some students get super excited and kick in after some of those activities, which was not what I was expecting. 
Yeah, so we do have another question in chat. Sorry, I have to interrupt here. There's another question in chat. Um, What is the relationship between software architecture and software design? Good question. Uh, I would, oh, go ahead, Wes. I think it fits for <laughs> lines anyway. So it's always a good question when you stump everybody, right? No. So yeah. I, mean, I, I can answer that, which is that that uh, the way I think about it is software architecture is sort of the bigger cloud level, you know, the thirty thousand foot you know view where you're really trying to figure out how do you define those interfaces that we were talking about before, right? How do you define? How do you compartmentalize the code? And then design is more, okay, now once you've laid out the big picture, you know, it's like then you're connecting circles and arrows together, right? Then you're actually, you know, drawing the lines between them and actually making stuff work and you're thinking at a more detailed level. I I suspect other people could actually totally reverse that definition, right? I mean, those are both nebulous concepts, so there's there's not a right or a wrong. But for me, the architecture point is uh, sort of like the class structure, you know, in in an object-oriented world, and the design part's more the function structure, but that's probably me. Good question. Uh, so yeah, I would agree that you can definitely reverse them. Um, in fact, I was thinking if I were going to answer that question with an analogy, it, you would almost flip it when you're talking about like houses. So an architect versus a designer um, and the level of detail they get into um, for what they're doing. But I don't think it's a wrong answer at all. Like I think it absolutely works from the software side of things. It, Software is fantastic in the sense that uh, it, it's a it's a it's not a physical construct. It's not something that has a physical component to it necessarily. So it, it's kind of nice to I don't know be able to play in that nebulous space and kind of make it up as we go almost. And I, I think we're getting told we need to move on here. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, Alex is up next. Right? Yeah, so uh, if we go to the next slide. OK, um, yeah, managing a project for success. So this can either be at like the like a, a larger team level, like a, or a sub team level, I guess. Um, or I guess it could be a team level. Or it could be for like a, a specific uh, like project, I suppose. So um, generally, you want to have a good idea of what your management structure is um, before you start a project. Um, this goes for like anything, I guess, not just software. So um, you'll usually have, at least in FRC, um, you'll usually have a, a couple of students leading a project um, with maybe a mentor or two that's uh, kind of more knowledgeable about that subject and is available to help. Um, this is, it's nice to have, uh, like from a student's perspective at least, it's nice to have like one or two mentors that are, um, that kind of are updated like frequently on what's going on. So you don't have to brief uh, like a mentor every time you need uh, some assistance with like troubleshooting or something. Uh, so it's good to get that defined before you start. Um, for It's good for communication, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, but when you're, I guess, on a lower level, um, inside within projects, it's also important to define um, or to figure out like how you're going to define success. Um, I think Wes is going to talk about that in a little bit. But this is important because it kind of helps you uh, figure out what kind of projects you need to be working on and what kind of projects um, maybe you don't need to be working on. So this is pretty nice, um, especially if you're a software sub team, or I guess like any any sub team or team, if it's pretty small. Um, like our software sub team in the last couple of years has been uh, less than ten people, so at least on this, at least for students. So this is really nice because we have a limited amount of resources, and we need to figure out how we're going to efficiently uh, meet like goals uh, so that our robots are competition ready. Um, generally, how you uh, how you prioritize stuff. Um, that's differs from like robot to robot, team to team. Um, yeah, there's. I don't think there's a super good way of uh, defining everything. Um, yeah. So as for inter team and inter project communication, uh, it's really important that uh, everyone in a project or everyone in a sub team or everyone on the team uh, knows what's going on at like any any given point. Uh, you don't need to really communicate um, super like low level stuff. Like uh, maybe if you're for software, for example, if uh, you wrote like a new class or something one day, um, that's not necessarily that useful unless maybe it's, it's a big shift in your software architecture, like your, your predefined structure. Uh, but this kind of, everyone should be updated uh, within a sub team, within a project, within a team on kind of the goals and uh, 
the goals and like deadlines for every other thing. Uh, this is also nice for handoff between like software and uh, hardware uh, sub teams because uh, it's good to know like when you should expect to have um, some specific part of code written by uh, so that you can test it as soon as like the, the hardware uh, side of your team finishes uh, some component or some uh, mechanism. Um, we've had uh, 254 at least, Team 254. In the last couple of years, we've tried stuff like uh, using Google Docs to kind of um, outline exactly what needs to be get what needs to be done uh, before like some certain date um, with like deadlines and stuff. We've tried Trello. Um, really, it's it's kind of up to you how you decide to communicate. Oh yeah, we also do build blogs, which um, they're basically uh, after every single build or every single meeting, uh, we'll kind of send out uh, like a, a document to the whole team that tells everyone what went on or what got done during that day and what we hope to get done the next uh, meeting or the next day. So uh, this kind of stuff, it's not uh, th it's not one size fit all. Um, there's gonna be stuff that works better for our team that is maybe not gonna work as well for your team and uh, vice versa. So uh, it's really up to you to kind of experiment around and figure out uh, what the best way to communicate is. Um, as for documentation, uh, this is really important when you're doing um, when you're creating software for uh, that can be reused from year to year, um, or if you're writing stuff for like a, a reusable architecture, I guess. Yeah. So uh, this is this can be uh, really helpful if you're doing stuff like a build blog. Um, well, doing stuff like a build blog can help with documentation because it's kind of a build blog or something like that kind of documents the thought process behind each piece of um, like software, I guess. So it's Good to, it's, it's nice to have a resource to look back on um, to kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, yeah, that's, I think we have a poll. That's basically all for me. Yeah, so our next poll is, to what extent do you train new members on existing architecture? And yeah, this has several more options. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, uh, so one of my one of my following questions, I think, you know, your ending points of documentation are, are critical because during build season, I suspect most people don't get a whole lot of documentation done. Uh, just just guessing, and that that actually comes, you know, later. And so you're, you know, that's uh, to some extent going against architecture, right? Architecture, you really ought to be defining something, you know, early. But again, FRC is such a fast, rapid development kind of process. You end up. Uh, documenting the architecture after you've finished it, which is unfortunately backwards. You know, you, you um, uh, hopefully in in bigger projects out in the real world, you'll find that it's a little slightly more slower pace when you have an entire quarter to get something done, and you, you're better able to define the APIs and interfaces ahead of time. So yeah, thank you. Um, a few questions in the chat. Sorry, you can go ahead. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm happy okay. to go. Um, we want questions. Yeah, one of the questions in the chat are, uh, what are some important soft or non-technical skills for software architects to possess? People. Communication. Uh, I, communication Alex hit communication, it. Communication. Communication. Yeah, yeah. Communication and organization. And then the other one that I would add to that list is empathy, uh, because the best software architects understand the outcomes that they're trying to deliver. And you get that by being empathetic to the person you're trying to deliver those outcomes for. So, yeah. So, I mean, let me. Um, I, I the sixteen seventy eight team knows I harp on communication. Every sub team in our team knows that I harp on communication. So, I'm going to give you one. Of, I think the best lessons that I've picked up in the last couple of years, which is that a lot of programmers, and it's not just in the programmers, a lot of team members don't understand the entire project. And so, you know, you're asking uh, programmers to go, hey, we want to go interface with this with the Robo Rio and it's in slot six. And, you know, that's going to connect to a Falcon. And they have no idea what you're talking about. They're just trying to, you know, so one of the things that, that I like, you know, our teams to do is go walk programmers, go walk fab teams around or go walk the electrical team around the final robot because you all know your pieces, but it's really hard to communicate if nobody's on the same page in terms of terminology. So in 10 minutes of like walking a team around the robot saying, this is the Robo Rio, this black thing, right? These Falcons are over here. These, you know, actuators are over here. That, that really helps programming go faster because they have a clue what you're talking about. 
Sorry, that was a soapbox. No, it's I, I'm right there with you. I do the same thing. In fact, anytime there's confusion, I, I, I'm known for making students redo work in the lab occasionally. Uh, so they'll do something, and then it, it turns out they're using the terminology that the other sub team doesn't understand, or they've they they've been using some convention that nobody else is aware of. So I will intentionally make a point of stop. Like we're going to stop, and we're going to go have the discussion, and. You know, you're not the one who gets to make that call, but it's fine if you did. The other team just needs to be aware of it. So to, to Alex's point about keeping a build blog, we do the same thing. We have a meeting summary channel in Slack and students re- like continuously, they'll post a picture, they'll post updates. This is what we did. This was the progress that we made. And we do that in the preseason too, not just build season. Uh, so every time we have a meeting, there's something in there. That also helps and know who to go other. ask when you run into something new, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you have a build blog, right, it's like, well, now I know who the expert in that field is so that when I have a question about something, I don't have to, like, go to five people to figure out who it is I'm going to talk to. Well, that's the faster. Yeah, Ludi, go. Yeah, we have another audience question. Um, what are some principles of good software architecture documentation? Readability. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, so, I'll know it when I read it. No, uh, I think... So, Go ahead, Wes. No, 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 you go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say for us, I know one of the things we do, we try and write for a student level. So at least in terms of FRC, we're not writing documentation that it requires a, I don't know, years of experience to understand what's going on. We try and write documentation that somebody at... Uh Uh-oh. We lost Lost Marshall. (laughs) <laughs> All right, uh, Alex, how do you guys handle it? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think generally, if it's um, if it's if your documentation's understandable, uh, then it's fine. Uh, we have some, I guess, like for year to year, we do a big. Uh, we're not really big. Uh, I don't want to sound like bragging, but we do a code release every year. Uh, so there's a lot of feedback that we get from people like on Chief Delphi and stuff, like um, who've kind of read our code release they're not really sure uh what like some specific part of our code does uh that's a good signal f- that we should be documenting our stuff uh better or like how we should document our stuff better or where we should document or focus on documenting stuff um so i guess that's like one pretty specific example of uh something that helps it's not really a principle but it- it's feedback right so i always we try and make sure that question? we're yeah, um, our, our next question is, do you guys group co- do you guys do group code reviews in between different projects? We do. So the, uh, that, that has been sorry, one of the big takeaways in the industry in large, right? Over the past 20 years is the whole idea of code reviews and buddy reviews and peer reviews. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have heard of ducks, right? You know, if you can talk to a duck, and you can explain your code to a doc, then then you know you know you understand it architecturally. So so we actually you know a lot of our team members have ducks for, the, for that reason. Um, so yeah, you know uh, that that's always a big thing to make sure that uh, we use GitHub and pull requests and things like that, so that we make sure the code gets uh, reviewed. But, but I'll challenge your statement a little bit. Um, we don't review code between projects; we continually review it. No code ends right. up on the robot, apart from little dev code. But especially cost code that could break an assembly, no code really ends up on the robot that hasn't gone through code review. And it's a continual part of the process and it's ex- an expectation. It is not a step that happens at the end. Yeah, that the feels the same. takes more time. So, well, I was just going to throw on another question, Pylon, and then you can answer it, Marshall. That feels like yeah, it yeah. takes more time. Right? So how do you how do you account for that? So it's part of our development process and part of bringing new students on and educating them. So it's bringing in, bringing them in in a way that they the only way they know how to do this is through proper like Git flow, proper kind of you you submit a, a pull request and you have you're, you're documenting the issues and it's being reviewed before it gets merged in. So um, so that's I I don't know I don't know how to answer that other than it's just the way we do it. Uh, we don't have any other way. So, generally I will say my favorite works. stories. Oh, yeah. 
I will say my favorite stories are when like some of our students get into industry as an intern or as an employee and they walk into the team and they're like, well, why aren't you? Why, why did you think that was not going to get code reviewed? Or why were you not going to write a test? Like, of course you do this. This is just how you yep. develop it. Those always make me really proud. Yeah, to add to that, I, I, my, my day job sees me interacting with a lot of kind of upper management and sea level folks, and they're always impressed. Some somehow, inevitably, uh, one of my coworkers turns it to me and says, "Oh, by the way, did you know he builds robots with high school students?" And because uh, you know that's naturally what needs to happen in a meeting, but <laughs> uh, they'll talk about the the way they're doing things, and I, I don't know for for what it's worth the notion that we're doing this with the high school students now, I can't wait to see where software ends up in 10, 20 years time when these current students are out in the field and developing software for these companies because the current methods don't work. Like it's, it, it's an old school way of doing things and it's slowly changing, but it's taking time. Like not every company is Google. Like that's the reality of it. Not every company is Facebook. Not every company adopts these processes out of the gate. So most companies are still using old waterfall methodologies and struggling to adopt Git and trying to get to that point. So, yeah. so Alex, I think you wanted to say something and then uh, we probably should go to the next section. Oh well, yeah, so um, yeah, it's, we generally just do um, some form of code review between uh, like when a project is, okay, so, so kind of the way that we work on code is we'll have uh, like a master branch in Git and then, or on GitHub, and then we'll get GitHub, and then we'll have uh, like different branches uh, for each project. So um, between like time that code is like copy pasted or like from a branch to master or merged or whatever, um, generally there'll be some form of code review. Uh, since our teams are pretty small, it's not like a big code reveal. Or since our like teams working on projects uh, are pretty small, it won't be like a like a big group code review with like ten people or something. Uh, it'll generally just be like the project lead uh, talking to like a mentor, or, like a student, or something, or a senior student or a mentor. Yeah. Do you guys review all the pieces of your code at the same level? Like we look super uh, detailed at some code and other code spend less time on. Or I guess it depends. Um, if we have less time. We won't necessarily do like a like a more in depth like group uh, group code review. Um, generally, people will be expected to kind of uh, like write tests or whatever, or uh, go through their code like on on their own time mostly, or with like maybe one other person outside of build time. It, it kind of just depends on um, it. Kind of depends on like how much time is left and what the project is. All right, well, let's go on to the next section. Um, so we have time to do the closing at the end, too. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is success. And so, you know, you do, starting with architecture, right, you should really figure out what are your requirements? What do you, what do you actually need to do in order to actually win? <laughs> and it's not just win, in order to be effect effectual in, in what your project's goals are, regardless of whether it's robotics or not. And then did you meet them? And did you meet all of them? And so that, you know, it's a changing list over time, but you should really keep track of, are we headed the right direction where we are actually going to get to success? It's very easy in software to get distracted and into little tiny pieces. So define success what it is, you know, before you actually start. And then code to that definition and, and more importantly, constrained scope to that definition. That's really important in a, in a fast build section, right? It's very, very easy to go, well, I'm going to go write a new class to do something, right? You know, maybe that should better be done in the off season, uh, you know, the base classes and stuff like that. So constrain what you're doing to, um, the, to, to meeting that success and throw away everything else until you get to your success goals. And the other question is, who are you writing it for? A really good quote I heard the other day is, you could have the world's most tested, perfectly executing code, but if nobody wants to run it, is it any good, right? And so you should know who is it that's going to run your code. Nobody in, in robotics is writing code for themselves only, where you're the only voice that matters about how good it is. And so you have to make sure that everybody is happy with the results and everybody can use the results and you know, use uh, whether it's driving a robot or you know, entering stuff into a tablet or you know, looking at a spreadsheet to determine rankings and things like that. Everybody should be able to use it. So you have to, you have to you know, ask questions to your fellow teammates to figure that. 
So once you have the notion of, of uh, what you want success to be, how do you measure it? Right, measuring happiness alone and whether people are smiling or not, you know, well, that's good, but you should really be able to measure, you know, the success of is your project actually doing? So you have to measure two aspects of that. One is measure things that go right. Our robot scored, yay. Uh, data entry, you know, properly went into the spreadsheet and didn't get, you know, uh, rounded downward or something on the path, right? And then you have to measure when things go wrong. If your robot hit a wall, whose fault is it? It's autonomous car problems, right? Is it Tesla's fault or the driver's fault when the driver's not touching the wheel? And it's like, how do you, as in an autonomous you know, mode, you have the same sort of issue. But even if a driver is doing, if you don't have the code that interfaces well with the steering wheel and, and the operator, and you know, it's, not, it's not the driver's fault, it's your fault if it's your code. Um, so make sure that, that you, know, you measure, look for things that both are right or wrong. And then you have to ensure that your success is consistent from, from you know, this week to the next, from this build to the next. So design you know, your work according to, uh, to make sure that it always meets the design, it always meets the ex expectations and the users you know, don't get lost. You have to make sure that if you're doing rapid updates and, and build season that you have to keep the users educated, right? We talked a lot about communication. Um, and then, you know, software tests uh, are, I push uh, test-driven development as a, as a way to think about writing code. It doesn't work all the time and you should know, you know, when, when it's important to write tests. Don't write tests for little tiny things that are always gonna be right. But you might wanna test all of your math, right? And one of the reasons for doing that is it takes time to deploy to a robot. It takes time to send the code over to the RoboRio. It takes time to deploy new scouting software to a tablet. That's time lost if, you know, you've run a bug and then you have to do it again. And then you run a bug and you have to deploy it. And, and that's a very slow cycle. Think about which parts of that that you were just doing, you can actually write a test for so you'll know within seconds before ever deploying. Uh, one of the things is that without many robots to pl play with, and there's lots of coders trying to, to write code, you know, to go to the robot, uh, you can shorten that cycle and, and, and get away from that um, if, you, if you design more testing code. Uh, the other, the last bit is is write reusable code. We've already talked about architecting between you know year to year, um, and so you want to compartmentalize and modularize your code. What part is reusable every year, and what part isn't? So, so next year I only have to rewrite this part, and the interfaces you know between it and things like that. So, what's the purpose of each of your code groups, and what what are the interfaces between them? But you know, as we said in the beginning, don't over architect either. So. Uh, that is it, and I think we'll go to the next poll, and then we have about 10 minutes before we wrap up. Yep, um, our final poll is, does your team review slash revise your architecture? And we do have two new audience questions. So um, one, what are the types of things you look for when reviewing code? And do you guys like to code on one single project together, or do you like to split different parts of a project to different people on the team? Uh, so the uh, the first one is, uh, can you repeat the first one again? <laughs> I got distracted by the second one. Yes. Um, what are the types of things you look for when reviewing code? So I do a lot of code review both for work and, and I, I review a lot of robotics code too, but, but it's actually important to have other people. Um, I personally, as a mentor, do not actually do code reviews and click, okay, you know, go ahead and merge this. Because I want all of the team members that are using that code to understand it. So it's actually very important to have parallel team members, the other people that are going to be using that function or whatever the modifications are to review it because that makes sure that you get cross team communication and things like that. So, um, you know, for me, it's not just looking for style and is the Python code PEP8 compliant and is there proper indentation and stuff. I'm reviewing, uh, is things testable, right? Will things go right or will things go wrong? And you read it every line of code with what could go wrong, right? But, but one of the other things to add there is it's also trying to make sure that the code's understandable. So you're communicating both to the compiler and to your fellow software folks. And so if um, I'm reading through code and it's super unclear what's going on or there's scattered variables or the names are bad or um, there's some tricky little logic in there that I just don't quite get and the comments aren't there. So I'll point those things out even if the code works perfectly well. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll add on to that. We we definitely don't do so to, to comment on it two ways. One is testing 
Uh, I know of a lot of groups that claim they do software testing and I run into this in industry and what they're really doing is linting and they're looking for specifics for how the code is formatted and whatever, but they're not actually looking at the code. They're not reviewing it for the substance. They're not reviewing it for does it deliver the outcome that we want. So when we do code reviews, we focus on is this functional? Is it documented? Is it committed in a way that you know we think it's going to do what we intend for it to do rather than is it properly formatted i have no problem with people who that's their passion in life is formatting code it's not me <laughs> like i don't care if you use tabs or spaces and for the record it better be spaces but i do care that you're doing it right like that the, the code is functional so that it does something that it needs to do so Yeah, the oh, second sorry, question ahead. was, um, do you guys like to code on one single project together or do you like to split different parts of a project to different people on the team? We do have only a few minutes left. Okay. I'll jump on Alex, this one. Answer. Oh, Alex, you want to take it? Oh, yeah, sure. Or you um, I guess it's almost always preferable to kind of split projects between different team members. Especially if it's like a big project, like uh, like your entire vision code or something, or your entire autonomous stack, because um, it's just faster that way. Um, and as long as you communicate properly and document properly, and all the other stuff we talked about, uh, should be no issues with that. We like to pull some of that back to the architecture question. So if you have people working on the same side of an interface intermix, that doesn't end well. But if you can define your interface points well enough then now you have a contract where you can get two people working independently, and then they can come together. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually I'll get those right. yeah. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, software architecture tends to follow um, the org chart. So it's kind of like, if you have this small group of people working together, you want to figure out how to divide things up in such a way that you can get some parallelism over there. It's always said a little tongue in cheek. Yeah. I. Uh... I definitely think it's, it, it, I don't know, it somewhat depends on the size of the team. Uh, if your team is like 10 students and you're all focused on building a robot, you've probably only got two or three people that are focused specifically on the, the coding is my guess. And it might be that those two or three pokes need to work in like the extreme programming methodology and work back to back to help review each other's code and make sure that it's accurate and going to do what needs to happen. Um, but the architecture needs to scale with the team almost. Um, and it, this goes back to, I think, Austin's comment, or it might have been somebody else, but uh, about re, uh, revisiting the architecture regularly and kind of reviewing it. In fact, that was the poll question, I think. So, But it's reviewing that architecture is part of the process of growing as a team and evolving, changing over time and iterating. Looks like most people do review. That's good. So, uh, we should probably pull up the final closing slide because I think that we're supposed to close here momentarily. And then, uh, Marshall, I think you're doing the recap. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, in summary, uh, have a software architecture first and foremost. So decide on what you want to go for. In fact, there's a lot of examples that WPI Lib includes these days, which is a good place to start. And other teams as well have example code you can pull from. Uh, don't over-architect, so scope for the project you have and the size of it. So what works for one team might not work for others, so keep that in mind. Uh, before you start, one of the things you can do is help define what your success criteria is and uh, define who the stakeholders are for the team, uh, who are going to, like, who... who who is uh, the success important to? Manage your project and team for success, so same lines. And then uh, know that your code's gonna work, so testing uh, as much as you can, as well as looking at the code uh, in depth through reviews. And then lastly, iterate, 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 uh, which comes down to failing faster. So failure is not bad, it's getting back up and coming back at it again that helps keep things going. Very, very cool. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming to this presentation. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks, Thank you, Lydia, for hosting. Thank you all. <laughs>